have been, um, I've been a high school teacher for 18 years. Um, so I do high school art. I teach at McCallum High School with Carrie in back. Um, and I studied art in college um, and I really loved ceramics. And I, it was my high school art teacher who actually like inspired my love of ceramics. Um, and then when I moved to Austin, so this is some of my college work. Um, and this kind of helped inform the design that's on the pieces. So that's why I include that in there. Um, when I was a sophomore or a junior in college, I don't remember, um, but I lost a friend that I had grown up with in a car accident. I have a very old family, lots of old family members, and so I've been used to losing people who had lived really like long lives. I've had great aunts that lived to be 103 and 107. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen all these lovely, beautiful lives. Um, and so to lose somebody who was my age was really hard for me. And I came back to school and I had to do self-portraits. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with the idea of the human heart and how, um, how our world around us impacts the heart in different ways and how we can heal from it. And so I, I made, that was my first little foray in a slip casting. Um, and so I bought a medical model of the human heart and I learned how to make the mold and I learned how to figure out a recipe for clay to use. And I did all kinds of testing and made hundreds of little tiny hearts. Um, and then after that, to sort of ease myself out of that pain, I went back to this pattern of doodling that I'd always kind of drawn in the margins of papers, you know, just as I was paying attention to things. And so those, um, so I was still doing slip cast work, but I started to have, have those doodles on there. Um, and then when I moved to Austin, I went to Michigan State for school. I grew up in Michigan. Um, when I moved to Austin, I didn't really have kiln access. I, I was teaching at a high school, but it, we had one kiln for the students and I didn't have a setup for my work. And so I did a lot of drawing. So I still was pulling from the heart and the idea of your emotions and how that plays a role in the heart. And I started to do these illustrations that then incorporated those doodles and the vines or the veins of the heart in the thing mm -hmm. and adding collage work. So I was doing this all on paper um, and having those vines kind of grow and undulate around. And then mm -hmm. I started to set up clay again. And so those illustrations moved into my ceramics um, and moved back again because they were there before, but now they kind of had their own new little life force. Um, and then I took a class with Melissa Mancini and I learned about the ceramic decals <laughs> and it was just such a wonderful way to incorporate in that collage work that I was doing on paper onto my clay and I love color. Um, and so I still look at the little patterns that I do as the veins of a heart more so than like vines on a flower. That's what they represent to me. But um, not everybody loves a human heart on a piece of, <laughs> a piece of pottery. So I get to have that kind of special little meaning behind it, but it's still a very decorative floral piece. Um, and so that's where, that's where my work is taking me today. So that's what I'm going to show you tonight. And I'm used to teaching the high school kids, and so it's a little nerve wracking to be among <laughs> peers. Um, I'm so judgy. <laughs> But here is a quick little process video of everything I'm going to try to cram into tonight cooking show style. So I pour the clay, I sand the clay, I draw on the black lines, and I do all the color work on the inside, and it gets fired in, um, in place, and then I do the de I do an interior glaze, and then I apply the decal. So it's actually, all of my work ends up getting fired three times, um, because it's really important for me to sand the surface. And so I have to fire it once, sand everything really clean, do the black lines, fire again, so that the black lines don't smear around putting the decals on, um, and then that final firing. And is it a low fire decal? It is, um, a, it goes multiple firing ranges. Okay. So it's the, I buy the commercial decal sheets and I have them here okay. tonight and I cut them all up into those decal sheets. Um, and I fire, I use the Laguna porcelain slip, so it's a cone five slip. I fire to like a hot cone five. Um, most of the colors stay pretty vibrant. Mm -hmm. um, there are colors that burn out a little bit more. Um, green changes under my glaze a little bit. And so it just kind of varies with what, what I'm doing. So I have, 
I have joked with my husband about making like a little mini kiln so I could like stick things in this little fake kiln and then pull them out. Cause it's <laughs> not gonna do that. Didn't have, didn't have time for that. Um, so this is a slip that I used. I used to make all my slip in college. Um, I had all these recipes in Michigan that I liked but hadn't perfected. And then I learned about how clays are regional and how it wasn't easy to find the same things. And so I used a couple of different commercial slips, but I really liked the Laguna Berry White slip. Um, and again, it's a cone five slip and I use a tea strainer or a dish drain strainer to pour into my molds. Um, I make all of my own molds and I make them from um, a lot of found objects. So I will use like old dishes at time and then alter them with like craft foam to make different shapes or fins on them. This little bowl is actually the cap of a PVC pipe. And That's so brilliant. <laughs> I, li I like finding, like I'll find objects and then I'm like, oh, this would be a really fun shape. Um, wheel throwing has never been something that has been my focus. I enjoyed doing it, but I, I had a really hard time making identical forms and I really wanted to focus on the surface. So for me, slip casting allows me to make that form once that I really want or multiple times, depending on you know how often I'm making it and then recreate it and have that time to focus on the, the surface. All right, so this gets poured. This is the first part of the demo. Clay that is slip cast sits. It sits and it sits and it sits. Um, I'm gonna set a timer for about 15 minutes and then I'm gonna add a teeny bit more clay to this. And I watch the rim and so I see how it builds up and as the clay is um, as the water is absorbing into the plaster, you start to get these walls and ridges that build up. So let me set my timer. <coughs> if I don't set timers, I will forget. <laughs> how long have you been casting with this, these forms and, or, you know, return to clay? When was that? Around 2014, 2014. I, I really got yes. back into it. Yeah. Um, and I didn't start, I started trying to make my own slip again. And then I had a ton of issues with crazing and not having good fit on the glazes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a great, I was still in an apartment. I didn't have a great studio space. So I was trying to work like in those little bits of time that I got well full-time teaching high school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that wasn't, that wasn't working very well. And I have three young kids. I've got an eight year old, a six year old and a two year old. So I really have to be able to work within the times you know within those small bits of time that i get i'm fortunate to now be part-time and so that gives me a lot more flexibility in my schedule in terms of like i work on tuesday thursday every other friday so i'm able to have that time and space on mondays and wednesdays every week to work um but still with kids they get sick they you know things happen all right so this has cooking show style i don't want to tip it too much but it has a wall built up, so if you stand up a little bit, you might be able to kind of see. Um, I poured it probably a little earlier than I normally would have, so it's a little thicker than I usually cast. Um, it's like slightly thicker than a quarter of an inch. It will get sanded down, it will end up, um, I'll sponge it, I'll clean it, I'll sand it down, so it's gonna get a little slimmer as it goes. But I just, once it's gone through that casting process, it goes on the bucket, it sits, I do the other things that are going on in my life. Um, and I try to cast about three pieces a day is my goal for myself, um, which doesn't seem like a lot of work, but again, I'm just working in those little bits of time. Mm -hmm. So it builds up. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave this here. And then like magic. <laughs> This one is ready to pop up. It's so cute. And so this is a piece when it first pops out and you can see that the edges are a little bit rough still. Um, these molds have seen a lot of use, so they need to be remade soon. Um, they say you can get about a hundred casts out of a mold. You can get more, it's a simple mold. Um, if it's a multiple part mold, which I have some of those, they will start to chip and break a lot more. Um, but a simple one piece mold, they can, they, they can work pretty hard. Um, but I'll sponge off the surface and I'll use just like a flat piece of plastic on a flat surface and some water to clean up the rim and make it nice and even. 
Um, and then before it goes in the kiln the first time, once it's been sponged, I do all the inside color work. So, and I use different underglazes. I will occasionally, I've been working more with coloring the actual porcelain clay. So I have certain colors that I, I use the actual clay to color the inside. So I'll pour the clay in, I'll let it sit for a certain amount of time, I'll pour it out, and then I'll switch colors and pour in a new color of slip. And then the cast will automatically have that interior lining that's already a color. Um, it's something I'd like to do more of, but I just, I've got a few colors that I've been working with and I am slowly building that up. Um, any questions so far? Yes. So you have my really basic question, but starting with a piece of PVC pipe, mm -hmm. you're coating it in plaster. Yes. So I take the PVC pipe. So this is, and I, you know, it usually has some kind of markings on it. So I'll try to sand down the surface a little bit and make it smooth. Um, use some Murphy's oil soap and I'll coat the surface to give it a little bit of a resist or a little bit of a, a slippery release. release surface. And then, um, I'll cut a circle of clay so that I have this little inset area, this little lip for overflow. So that if the clay, um, if I pour the clay up to that area, the mold will cast, you know, all the way around and then I can just trim it down to the edge of that line. Um, I tend to just watch it and I pour it like right up to the edge and then not overflow, but I just, I knocked that one so it overflowed. Um, and then you mix up, I use powdery plaster, I mix it up. Um, I use PVC, or not PVC, but uh, the metal sheathing to create my form around it. So you can buy rolls of mm -hmm. like metal sheathing. Flashing. And then I just, yeah, flashing. flashing. Yes, flashing. Um, and then I um, pack the edges with clay so I don't get any spillage, pour in the plaster, and then it sets up and you get that little piece out. And sometimes it comes out easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes it's a little trickier. Um, <laughs> And that's how you would make a simple one part mold. And a one part mold is really easy to cast with. Um, the heart was a more complex form. It was a four or five piece mold. Um, so you have to build the, you have to kind of block the different areas as you go because you've got to watch out for undercuts um, because if it can't just lift cleanly out of the area then it's gonna get stuck inside. And it does shrink a little bit when it's coming out of the mold. You can see there's teeny bit of wiggle room around this and this hasn't been fired yet it's just dry but there's a significant difference so there is a there is a large shift between that final glazing that wow. is amazing yeah. yeah it's a really it's a really like clean way to see how much shrinkage there is on the clay um, so this is another one. I'm use this board. So I poured this earlier today. It usually takes um, a few hours for the clay to be ready to come out of the mold. You can make it faster. You can dry them. You can use compressed air to kind of go around the room to help them release. Um, I just don't typically do that because I don't have. I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. So I just let it work out its process. And then when it's ready to come out, it will do so nice and easy for me. Do you take stuff out mostly bone dry? I try to take it out when it's still a little bit more towards leather hard. Um, this form, if I wait too long, it will actually pull at the foot and it can <laughs> crack at the bottom. Oh. So. This one I have to watch more closely. These, if I forget about them, it doesn't matter. Is it just pop up? They just pop out. So this um, was a bowl form that I used, um, a bowl that I found that I liked the shape of, and I used just craft foam, sticky craft foam, oh, to yeah. kind of add those little yeah. ridges to it and then make the casting of it. So um, yeah, I would love to be a better wheel thrower. But you gotta pick your area to just kind of <laughs> focus in. And if you're gonna pour slip in that's colored, what at what point do you do that? Like, how, what dryness is the outside? I wait until the sheen just goes away slightly. Okay. So if I it's still pretty wet then. Yeah. So like this one, that's been dumped out. The sheen has already gone away. I would pour the color in right now. Okay. 
Um, and I make the outer wall much thinner, so I probably have the outer wall, probably pour that first layer in for about 15 minutes, pour it out, let that kind of dry up just a little bit, and then pour that new clay in of a different color. Um, and there's artists that do a lot with colored stuff, like Peter Pincus mm -hmm. mold making, mm -hmm. and and so I've seen his, I went to one of his, um, or a couple of his demonstrations now, but he will talk about like, why would you make a one part mold when you can make a hundred part mold? <laughs> I'm like, I adore him, he is fantastic, but I am on the, I, a one part mold is perfect for me, like two parts. <laughs> Um, but I don't have the, to make that multi-part mold, um, it gets really complicated and I just, I need a clean, easy form so that I can focus on that surface decoration. So on the multi-part form, do you, I guess you make them as one piece and then cut them apart? I don't, that's what he does. Uh, so he's got a big bands or a big scrolls out bands on, I'm not yeah. sure what it is, but he'll like put it through and I mean, if you don't follow him on Instagram, I, it's my... My personal vote for him. Um, my students at the high school probably get annoyed because they talk about him all the time. <laughs> and my husband's like, you have a crush on him, and I'm like, yes, a clay crush. <laughs> um, there's uh, the, oh, I'm not forgetting your name, um, the artists in Seattle who do the colored slip and then carve into it. Forest. 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 Mm -hmm. So he'll do layers of colored slip and like build up all these layers, pour color in, pour color out, pour color in, pour color out and then use carving tools to carve through those layers so you can see all of the different layers of colors. I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful stuff that's happening out in the slip casting world. Um, so I've got these two that are popped out of the mold. I would clean them up. I usually let them dry more before I clean them up. So I um, sponge the surface. I will even up the rim with a flat piece of plastic and some water on it. And then I paint that interior color. And then they go back in the kiln. So do you tape down your plastic with a little bit of water? How do you, the plastic not just fold it? It's like a thicker plastic, it's not super thick, but it's a plastic mat that's actually a grid, the, the piece that I use is a grid that is used for cutting. like measuring. It's uh -huh. not thick enough for cutting, cutting. on, it's not uh -huh. a like a self-healing board, uh -huh. but it, I think it was actually something for sewing or for quilting that I okay. found. Okay. Um, and somehow it's has ended up, and it's smooth and it's yeah. small enough that I can do it on a lot of surfaces so yeah. I can really move it around. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't take up, it's on a huge board so it doesn't take up a lot of space. Yeah. Um, but you can do it directly on a table mm -hmm. or on a countertop and mm -hmm. just clean it up afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and anything that I can do to prevent dust, so any kind of wet work that I can do, wet sponging, wet sanding, I'm always trying to do that rather than anything that's gonna like scrape away at it or create any kind of dust. So these are fired and I'm gonna pass this around with one of the finished or with this one. So this is um, fired twice. This has been sanded. Um, this has not been sanded. So this has been bisque fired, but not yet sanded. We can pass those around. This is the second firing for it still just bisque? The second firing is just another bisque okay. firing. And sometimes I will bisque to a lower temperature depending on what is in my kiln and if I can get away with, like a, if I have a full kiln of just greenware stuff, I will bisque fire to, um, not super low, but like um, 06 or 07. So it's a little bit softer so that when I'm sanding it, it goes a little bit easier. Um, and then I'll do a regular bisque fire once I put the black on to an 04. Okay. Um, you said you sand it after the first biscuit? Yeah, so I sand it after the first bisque and I sand underwater and I use all of these different things. So I have the diamond core sanding bits or sanding pads. Um, I like this just um, silicon carbide paper. It wears out faster, <clears throat> but it's thin and I can get it around the surfaces. And I'll have a bucket of water more. I'm not going to do a whole sanding demo because it'll take a long time, <laughs> but um, I start with about a 200 and I just keep it underwater. Where's my finished piece? And I'll just sit there and watch TV <laughs> <laughs> and rotate it around. 
So that's like, wet dry transition. This is wet dry, yep. So these are these are just from Amazon. They're also diamond sanding pads. Um, they hold up pretty well. But the difference in the surface from sanding it for me is like a critical part of the process. And so I spend a lot of time sanding more than more than it takes me to do the surface designs. Um, I try to make sure that like every little mark from the sponge is gone. Um, and the difference in texture between those two is apparent, but then the difference in texture on the final piece, and I can, you know, I'll have them all up again, but you can feel on the final pieces how smooth it is. And then how there's some contrast from the decals because the decal surface is a little bit rough. Mm -hmm. So what grids do you use? So I use, this 200, this 400 gets a lot of, a lot of use. Um, this is a 400 in the diamond core pads, um, also gets a lot of use. And they're just slightly different, and so I'll kind of flip-flop back and forth. And then this is an 800. Um, but I find that, and this is 600, um, I find that I can get a similar sort of surface with the silicon carbide sandpaper that went through it. And this isn't even really... I don't know that it's technically wet dry sandpaper, but it holds up well enough that I can get some good sanding in with it. Okay, so then, let me check my mold. I'm gonna pour a little bit more clay in this so I can see the wall starting to form. It's about an eighth, an eighth of an inch thick. It's warm in here and it's actually making a skin on top of my clay in the bucket. <laughs> I'm just gonna give this a shake. I have a power drill mixer that I'll use to mix it up. And I pour through that sieve because I recycle every little bit of it. So there's always like the possibility of little chunks going back in. And if those chunks get poured into the mold, you will end up with like a chunk sticking out of the bottom. <laughs> have it kind of bubble up over that surface. Okay. All right, so sanded, clean, then I do the black lines. So I've got a sanded piece, theoretically, this is all clean and precise, and I draw on with a black, um, a black underglaze, all of the initial line work. And I use a ball syringe and I keep a piece of paper towel handy and my little needle so I can test it. And I freehand it. So I just start these, this is wet, so it's gonna bleed a little bit. Um, but I just freehand all these little vine shapes. Uh, and I do it on this one. So I'm not sanded, but... Um, it's got a little fine tip. Sorry if you don't like that little scratching noise. <laughs> um, my husband is very supportive of what I do, but he hates the feel of unglazed clay. <laughs> so sanding everything makes it palatable for him. <laughs> um, but I just freehand all of those little lines and they kind of move around the surface. And I think about the spaces that I'm creating for the petals eventually. Um, but if I were to try to add those petal decals on at this stage, then I would smear the black line work mm -hmm. because you have to get them wet in order to apply them. Which black do you use? I use the LUG, the Amico LUG black. Mm -hmm. So it's slightly more pigmented than the, the um, velvet. Velvet. Do you add Darvan or anything? To no, I don't add anything. If I need to thin things out, I usually use a little bit of distilled water, but um, and now I don't have anything else mm -hmm. to it. And I, I do have to, like, I have to keep the needle in the syringe. If I don't keep the needle in the syringe, it will <laughs> get clogged. Um, if I haven't worked in a while, these components come apart. Um, so you can take them apart and then clean out the insides. Um, and I will definitely have to do that if it sits for too long. Um, and if I make, hmm? 
How long did it take you to get that precise? With, I, uh, the I tried a ton of different ways of doing it. Um, I started, when I started working back on clay and trying to get these designs on clay, I started using the underglaze pencils. Mm -hmm. And they have two, they skip too much across mm -hmm. the surface for me. I wasn't getting a dense enough line and they smear really easily. Mm -hmm. And so I was having problems just like handling my own work and not smearing it. And this dries really quickly on the surface and then I don't smear it at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's also easy for me to, if I like make a mistake or if I go too thick in an area, I'll just take my little tool and kind of pop that line back out. I so I can scratch tool. into it. Yes, it's my, it's like my favorite tool. Yes, <laughs> my favorite one. Um, so I can kind of clean them up. I'll sometimes turn it for like, every once in a while this will make a little burst so mm -hmm. you can find mm -hmm. where it just like has a little bubble bubble stuck in it and it squirts out and I will I embrace that as part of the design it's part of the work and so I'll like turn that into a little piece that has like tendrils sticking off of it um if you look you can find them on there because they exist um but so I started with the underglaze pencil and I used to glaze the outside of the surface. So I would glaze the inside and the outside. And I had problems with the underglaze pencil just being too faint and, um, and smearing. And then when I would glaze it, it the glaze that I would be using would kind of eat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I would do all of this work. And I went through all these kiln, kiln modes and processes trying to learn like what I want or trying to figure out what would work best for me and what I was trying to do. And then I would fire it and it would pull it out of that fire and it would either have like melted down and dripped everywhere um or just been eaten by that outer glaze and so it was a it was a process to try to figure this out i used to paint it for a while so i'd sit there with a little paintbrush and paint all the vines on individually and that took ages and so i would get the effect that i wanted but it was just not a very um sustainable practice mm -hmm. um I tried the blue syringe first, which is a slightly, it's too big. So I had the blue syringe and I was all ready to go. And I was like, I kept getting closer and closer with this red syringe is my favorite. Um, and I, I get, I just kind of embrace, these are natural little designs that I'm making. So they just kind of embrace the, the little flaws or, you know, ball, bubbles that kind of appear in them. Um, and if I really want to get rid of something, I scrape it away. And so I do all of this work, and then it goes back in the kiln and gets fired. Um, and then when it's out of the kiln, it's fired. So now I can take water to this, I could wipe this, it's on the surface, it's secure. So now I could go through and start to add my decals to it. And it's nice and soft for me. And I can feel the line. Mm -hmm. I can feel the underglaze. And I like those differences in texture. Um, and so I have to, the liner, the glaze that I use is a matte clear. And it is very opaque when you put it on there. But that color will pop back through. Um, but so if I, put the, if I put the glaze on the inside and I don't label it, I will forget what color I've worked with. <laughs> and then have to scratch into my glaze to figure it out. So I have to be very careful about making sure that I give myself a little indicator of what color it is on the bottom. So I remember what decal I need to use. And not every color, not every color has, they don't make the ceramic decals in every color. And you can make your own. Um, and that's part of what I learned in the class. And so there, like, there are some that I have made, but I need to get I need to come up with more patterns and then make more of my own um, screen transfers for underglaze decal. So when I don't have a decal option, I will just use glazes and underglazes. Mm -hmm. It's like this has no ceramic decals on it. It's just all painted. Um, and I mix the, the underglaze and the glaze so that some of them are more rough and some of them are more smooth. So you again have that kind of tactile surface. Um, but when I'm ready for the decals, this is what they come looking like. So you buy them by the sheet. And then, and they come in a ton of different patterns. And red, blue, and green, red, blue, green, and black are very easy colors to find. Though I do find that the green changes 
more quickly under the glazes. So if I do put an outer glaze on something, like these are glazed on the exterior and the blue does not really change. Um, but you can see that softens the lines where mm -hmm. it's glazed on the outside. Mm -hmm. That's um, a nice matte. What is that? Yeah, it's the Mako. Mako. Um, Mako Matte Clear. Matte Clear, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Nice and soft. Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, it's And it doesn't eat the, because some of the, like, the shinier clears were just eating mm -hmm. everything that I did. Whether it had, whether it was zinc free, whether it was not zinc free, you know, like it was, mm -hmm. it just wasn't having a lot of success with them. So I will cut all of these little details out. So again, a lot of my processes I just do in stages. I'll carry things around with me. Like this is really good when I travel. Uh -huh. I can just carry this little container around and cut things when I'm not, when I don't have my hands full with something else. Um, but so I'll cut out the little decals, keep them in little baggies. And then I've got this one that is glazed on the inside. So it is ready for that next step. And I will take a sponge and pull out the different patterns. And I place them all on there individually and figure out what fits best. And then you just use some water to apply them. Some patterns transfer better. Mm -hmm. They're easier to transfer. Some are more finicky. Um, some colors transfer more easily. Some are more finicky. And so I try to watch the edges of where the pattern is and you'll start to see a little bit of bleed. And then you know that it's ready. I'm gonna put a few on here and then I'll peel them off. And then around these petals, after I have them all on, I go back through and I add more black line work. You can kind of check them. So I peel it back a little bit with my nail and I check it and I've got this nice little transfer. And these can smear, you have to be careful with them. I try to handle everything really carefully. Um, but then I'll go back in and add in interior designs or little dots on the outside. And sometimes just some black petals to fit around. I really like how you take that and the shape ends up taking a commercial look and making it completely your own and then adding the black to it as well. So the shape and the extras. Okay. Yeah. And I'm always playing with new colors and trying, um, trying to find other like other colors to to work with um so i can get like a full range i mean i don't want to just have like every color that mm -hmm. would be my goal is to, and i do have i mean i have um i have the full rainbow i just started making a little tangerine one mm -hmm. um and there are commercial under glazes that i use for those interior colors unless i'm mixing the color in with the slip but i would love to just like continue to expand that color palette mm -hmm. um and i've started to I do hand building as well. So these are hand built. Um, I've started to color some of my clay when it's for hand building too, so that I can add on these um, different pieces that are actually colored clay. I use the B mix, the Cone 5 B mix. Um, and I want it to have that interplay between the decals so that the colors match up. Um, so yeah, just anything that I can play with color on mm -hmm. is, is my thing questions <clears throat> so is this form right here do you like slip and score them together or yes. is that a mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah so this is a bigger pvc pipe <laughs> cap, and okay. this is a smaller pvc pipe oh. cap and then i use some of the same slip okay. and so this like i have to be careful about how when i pop them out of the mold if i'm not popping them out at the same you know temperature play if they're with one's more wet and one's more dry i can have issues but 
Um, I use the slip itself to combine them together. So yeah, Love this that. is just mm -hmm. yeah, you make it very accessible because I've never done slip casting and it's intimidating to me. Well, and that's yeah. So it's. Again, like the 100 part molds are exciting and awesome and I would love to one day be at that point where I can really play with mold making and have that be a bigger part of the process, but I'm not there. Um, and because the surface and the color is what I really wanna focus on, mm -hmm. this is perfect for me. Mm -hmm. And I like little tiny dainty things. Um, I love the, like I love the feel of the different the soft versus the kind of scratchier surface um, and just having something to kind of cradle in your hands. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of drive, that's what drives my work. And those vines are from the hearts. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of ties back into that memory for me. Um, so this would get finished and fired and then it's done. It's a, do you put a clear blaze over the for the yeah, last farm, right? I didn't nope. hear what you said with the So it just gets placed with that <clears throat> matte clear on the inside, but all of these are unfired on the outside. So okay. you can pass these around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you feel those versus you can, you know, we can pass out some of those, but um, this is glazed on the outside with the matte clear. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between what you can feel um, on the glazed exterior surface versus the not. And there's a difference to how it looks. The, the line gets softened. It's not as stark black. Um, so most of the time, especially on the slip cast work, I leave it unglazed on the outside because that porcelain clay is just so nice and buttery soft when it's been sanded. Um, whereas with the B-Mix, I feel like I can't get it quite as, quite as clean when I'm sanding it. So that's why I'll glaze the outside of the, the hand bill work. And then I just ordered liquid quartz. Oh, you did? I did. Yes. Or did you want us to give you $5 each and, and you'll give us an ounce? I mean, I, am, I, haven't, gotten, I haven't even gotten it yet. Um, so I'm so excited to, it's like liquid gold. to play with it. Um, but if you haven't heard about that, it's a company in Australia that makes a, um, it's called Liquid Quartz, but it's something that you put on the exterior or you put on clay that's unglazed and it um, is safety rated in Europe. So I assume that's higher than what our standards would be anyways, but um, it's safety rated for food safe after you use it. So if you like do raku pieces or alternative firings and they don't have a fully glazed surface, you're supposed to be able to. Is that something you fire or something you just No, on? it's at the final stage. And again, I haven't tried it yet, but it's. Wow. It I then, use it all And then the you use it all. Mm -hmm. You do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty magical. And it looks yes, super magical. Really I'm very excited it's about it. It's worth it. You're like, it's so expensive. And, and then the water just kind of, in the videos, the water like beads up off. on the surface yeah. and it. It's really, it's, it's pretty so, magical. Is it like a quick cinnamon? Hmm? <laughs> Supposedly. <laughs> it's like, that, you know that there, there used to be something that, I had a college roommate who had something she sprayed on her windshield that was like a rain repellent. Rain X. Is it just Rain X? Yes. yes. <laughs> but it's like Rain X for clay. Supposedly it's like a concrete uh, or like sealer. a sealer, mm -hmm. counter sealer, mm -hmm. like for stone. Oh, okay. Yeah, because there's some other artists so like Emily cool. Rowley. Yes. I don't yep. know if you so know that's colored in clay. England. Okay. She does like these funny little characters. Um, but she uses H seal, which you can find fire. on Amazon. Yes. Which supposedly yes. is like so chemically exactly twice. the same. Thing. That piece has been fired three times. Cheaper. So. Three times. In cheap. So, but I think you have to use a couple layers. Yeah. Yeah. So my mom has tried that, and it's blast. not so like liquid quartz. This is like a one and done magic. But the other you have to do two or three coats, and it doesn't seem to work out. So when I built it, I put all these petals on, but it's you know considerably. Those were so there was no design work. And then you fire it, and then you did the draw. Yeah. Yes. So I'll be here next. So, and the blue. We can stick all my stuff under the sink in here. This blue is the same. It's the same. Yeah. 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 Same color. This is so nice. That's cool. So, what would you say are like the biggest challenges of slip casting? Timing. Timing of the pour. Um, if it's if you leave it in too long, it will get thick. Like this is thicker than I would normally pour it. Mm -hmm. um, again, that while I can kind of show that now that this is dried, but I just take a rib along that little ledge 
and I save every scrap and I recycle it and I mix them back up. Um, if your molds are really complex, it can leak. Um, so like there are my heart molds that I used to make. There was a lot of, there was a huge learning curve on making those really complex molds at first with all these undercuts and having everything fit together and not chipping off things. Um, a one part mold is pretty accessible and easy to get into. Um, it can, I mean, you have to remake the molds. There are people who make masters of the work on the, you know, so that like they use a silicone or a blue, I think it's silicone, but like a blue, it's a blue mold making yeah. material and you can make a master of it and then it's easier to make all these um, molds off of it because that comes out a lot easier. Um, if you pour really thin, it can warp. Um, and like it, it shows, and I usually recommend hand washing and like not dishwasher and microwave. It would survive. I mean, it's been fired to a high enough temperature. It's safe to be used in those areas, but like it's thin because it's been slip cast. So it is going to, you're gonna feel that heat through it a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, and if, I, if I'm not paying attention to the work, if I get distracted, if my timer doesn't go off, which happens more than I would like to admit, um, because I didn't set it properly. <laughs> you didn't push start? It didn't push start. I thought I did and I didn't. But if I, then I will like, then I can just completely forget about it. And then I've got this very, very thick walled piece of clay in here. But then I just pull it out. I put it in the scrap bin and I recycle it. Um, so I don't know. One part mold is not hard to get into. Um, the more complex your forms get, the more complex it becomes. And if, like on those taller cups, um, the tumbler shape, that yellow one, if I pour too thick on those, I get cracking close to the edge. It's just too much tension where that little bar starts to like raise off the surface. Mm -hmm. So it cracks right along the stripe. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it might just be that it takes longer to release from the mold, so it's got more tension as it dries and it's kind of pulling at the shape <clears throat> because it's thicker, so it's stuck in there for longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, there's little nuanced things, but I don't know, I, I love slip casting. When you it's, remix mm -hmm. like all your scraps, um, are you just tap water, distilled water? Distilled water. Yeah. And then are you sieving it, I guess? Or? Yeah, so I mean, I use the same strainer and I just like have two containers and I go back and forth and back and forth until I, um, and I could probably test specific gravity more and like try to have it at a specific, you know, ratio every time and I don't. And as you pour, just from like, as I pour from this bottle and then pour back in and pour from this bottle and pour back in, it's thickening as I work with it because I'm drawing moisture out of it every time I'm using it. So there'll be times where I have to add some water to it and mix it up and sieve just like halfway through just to make sure it's the consistency I want it to be. Um, but I, it, for me, it's a manageable, set up and it's a manageable amount of workload and then because I can only do so many of these a day it it limits how much I put on my own plate um which with three young kids and part-time teaching mm -hmm. I only have so much time to do the work mm -hmm. and so it gives me a it gives me the amount that I can actually manage and work with and and have room for in my house while I build things up and this one, you can see it's starting to pull away from the wall. Oh, yeah. um, it's not ready to come out yet, but you can, it's starting to sort of release itself and it will probably be forgotten about there until the morning and then I will pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier about like preparing the mold. I think like preparing before, I mean pre, well, I guess preparing before you pour the, Oh yeah, you saw that earlier today. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wet the molds before I pour. Um, so I just, I, I, um, the mold dries out as you're not working with it. If I like, if I really push 
the pieces are, my schedule's like really perfectly timed. I can get um, two, sometimes even three pours done in a day. So like on a day where I'm not working and everything aligns and I started <coughs> early, then I wouldn't wet it in between. But if I haven't worked with them a couple days, if life has been busy, it's just sitting in my house drying out. So I just literally run it underwater to get a little bit more moisture back into the mold. Um, not a soak, not a long time, but just a little bit of moisture in there. And then I pour so it has that starting base of moisture so that it's not pulling from the clay too quickly. Mm -hmm. If it pulls from the clay too quickly or if the clay is too thick, um, I'll get really wonky edges up top and I'll see more of a skin forming. And then when I pour it back out, I will have these like clumps of clay that are sort of stuck together. Mm -hmm. So um, having a little bit of moisture in the mold, if I'm in a room that has like a lot of air going or that's a little bit warmer, I'll cover the top. If it's like a nice air conditioned room with not a direct fan, I don't need to, but um, that'll just kind of prevent that skin from forming on the very top surface, which again leaves me with a nicer rim when I don't have that skin form. You talk about using distilled water and mm -hmm. because I'm not someone who casts, why distilled water? I was getting staining oh. from, and mostly no, no, no. not really on the slip cast work, but I started using distilled because um, in my hand built work, I was using a different clay before the B mix. And when I would do that wet sanding, I was ending up with this yellowish staining that I assume is from the iron mm -hmm. leaching the through from the water. And so I switched to distilled just so I would have a little bit more control. And you got rid of it. Yeah, I switched clays from that clay too because I was still having problems with it. It just seemed to absorb everything more easily. Um, and the B-Mix doesn't seem to do that as much, but but it never really happened to the porcelain slip, but I don't know, I don't know why that is. Um, but I made that switch and it worked and so I'm just not messing with it. Um, How do you know when to pour off? I watch the wall. I so I mean and I know my molds now so I but I like this one is so this one's been in there for about 35 minutes um, and I can I can walk around with it but I spilled a little bit on the edge so it kind of went over but you can see oh the, the, the edge wall size of the wall. Yeah. yeah so I wait for it to be just under a quarter of an inch mm -hmm. nice. And then you pour all the liquid off? And then you pour all of it out, yep. And just the wall stays behind. Right. Cool. And I added to it, as you know, those like the 15 minute timers went off, I added in a little bit more, 15 more minutes go by, I add in a little bit more so that it, cause it'll, if you just do, just it all around. Um, <laughs> if you just, if you just pour it in and walk away, it will, um, start to angle down as it dries because you're losing some of the moisture out of it. So the volume that's inside there is going away and so it like lowers into it. So I have a vase, I didn't bring it tonight, but I have a vase form that is a two part mold. And so it's this bulbous form and um, it's cut in half this way. And so the I pour through the top and there's an extra well above the edge of the lip of the vase. Um, and I pour like two inches above the edge because it will just suck right down in there. And if I don't pay attention, the top of my base becomes really thin because I haven't been watching it closely and it's started to go so much lower than where the rim actually is. And so I have to add clay to that as well to make sure it stays above that level. And then everything gets trimmed off and thrown back into the container for, for reuse. Is there a limit to size? Your yes, what I can carry. <laughs> um, I mean, there are fancy slip casting tables, and there are um, there are some really cool molds that have been made so that you pour through the top, and then there's a release at the bottom, um, so that you can so that you don't have to pick it up and flip it over. But I have to be able to pick these things up and flip them over, and you are welcome to pick this up. It is not lightweight, so and I am I don't have. Um, I don't have a whole slip casting table. I don't have the um, 
the machine that automatically like turns it up and recycles everything mm -hmm. where you can just pour it back into that table and then it kind of goes back into production. Um, I could combine these together and do a five gallon bucket and then I would have a bigger um, opening to pour back into, but like, it's very witness today when I dump this back into the right. tiny little mouth here. <laughs> Like there is some spillage. So on that vase, the vase mold, the two-part vase mold is this wide and probably about that tall. So twice as much weight. And that is about the biggest that I usually work with. Um, anything outside of that, I'd be looking at trying to figure out how I can make multiple pieces and combine them together. So the thickness of the molds, um, how do you determine like for that bowl, you would want that much? I try to do at least two inches, mm -hmm. or roughly two inches around okay. the widest part. Okay. There are, I mean, again, the, the more even the plaster is, the better your absorption is overall. And so I could technically oh. like slope this so that it scales yeah. in. Yeah. Um, I could build up a wall of clay around there. Okay. Um, but I'd have to do that because you're pouring it like this. So I'm yeah. the, you know, so you pour it and it's, upside down because your piece is inside. So I'd have to figure out how to like Slend slope it. in the wall yes. to yeah. begin with, or I could shave all this away. Mm -hmm. I haven't had issues with it being thicker at the base to where I felt the need to do that. Right, you don't think that's the reason why it's um, where I need cracking. To well, so this point? one, it gets trapped on that okay. interior coat okay. ring. Okay. So as the clay is drying, it's shrinking, and if you wait, it, if you leave it in there too long, it's trying to shrink and there's something Around in the middle. that, yeah, 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 yeah. So then it, the tension of that being in the middle yes. and it having nowhere to go is yeah. what's causing it causing to. Causing that to yeah. gotcha. When you color your slip, do you use underglaze or mason stains? Mason stains, and then I just got some US pigments that I'm gonna try, so I haven't tested them yet, but I'm hoping that, um, I tried a red mason stain last year that I just didn't have. I was like, get my timer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I tried a red mason stain last year. Um, I, I'd been given a donation of, like somebody, had, they used to work with clay, gave me a bunch of their old mason stains, and so I, um, I didn't have information on it. I don't know if it was a good body slip, and it obviously wasn't, so I, used it and it looked really great in the container and it fired completely out. Oh. Yeah. Like almost more white than my clay by the time <laughs> no. it fired out. So. <laughs> so I got, yes, yeah, so I got some from US Pigment and I'm hoping that I can get a good red from that. So I'm gonna pour this one out. <laughs> And then I'll trim off that surface, and in a few hours, I'll be able to pop that one out. So why doesn't it get thicker at the bottom? Um, or maybe it does. If I poured really quickly, if I poured it out and then set it back down, those edges would sink back into the bottom, and the bottom would get thicker. Mm -hmm. I leave it like this until it's no longer shiny on the inside, and the clay is no longer moving. Mm -hmm. So I leave it upside down for at least 10 minutes. Um, oftentimes longer. Mm -hmm. A lot of my process is built around the ability to be able to like start something and walk away. Mm -hmm. So I will, I mean, I will be feeding my kids dinner and I'm like, okay, the timer buzzed and I'm just gonna go do this really quickly <laughs> and then I'll walk back. And, um, so it's, this part can really be in the background for me. Mm -hmm. um, unless I forget my timer. <laughs> That's it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.